Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Garcia, and this is episode one of How to Build a Solid Rocket Motor. I've gotten a lot of questions about how to build your own rocket motor. So by following along with this video series, I'll teach you how to build your own high-powered rocket motor safely using the best techniques that produce high-performance rocket motors just like the one that NASA will make. This video series will be much more of a tutorial than the liquid rocket engine series. My goal is to show you all the techniques you need to safely make your own rocket motor. Having said that, warning, this project will get dangerous. Solid rocket motors get more hazardous sooner than liquid rocket engines do. The barrier to hurting yourself is much lower. It's really easy to get in over your head, so it's your responsibility to understand what you're doing and to make sure that you are completely comfortable and safe in all the actions that you take. You must understand what you are doing, what your local regulations are, and what your own abilities are before you start this or a similar project. Alright, first up, architecture choices. We won't be doing sugar motors during this video series because they're lower performance and they're even lower barrier to entry, so they're even easier to get in over your head with. Instead, we'll be using an ammonium perchlorate composite propellant rocket motor. Ammonium perchlorate is a different type of oxidizer, and composite propellants use a different type of binding process than the rocket motors you might be familiar with. Composite propellants use a rubberized binder that holds the entire rocket engine together, and ammonium perchlorate is one of the highest performance oxidizers out there. APCP motors as a whole are stabler, more repeatable, more reliable, and safer than many other types of solid rocket motors, so we'll be using them for this project. Anyway, you get way more cool points by making the same type of rocket fuel that was used on the Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters than you do mixing together stump remover and sugar in your backyard. Now that we know we're going to be doing an APCP formula, we need to have a propellant formulation to work from. We won't be designing a new propellant from scratch. If this video went over all the intricacies of propellant chemistry, we'd still be sitting here talking even after the liquid engine is working. For this project, we'll choose a well-characterized solid rocket propellant, one with a lot of data that's publicly available, where the formula and procedures are also publicly available. Conveniently, there's one that fits the bill. One of my favorite propellants right now is called Cherry Limeade. It was developed by the MIT rocket team, and I had the pleasure of helping to work on that project. Conveniently, all the data about Cherry Limeade is publicly available through the MIT rocket team wiki, so we're going to use those procedures, those formulas, and that static fire data to help do our design. Alright, really fast, we're going to talk about the parts of a solid rocket motor at the hobby scale. At its simplest, a solid rocket motor is simply a series of concentric tubes, each made out of different materials. The outermost tube is frequently made from carbon fiber or aluminum and is called the case. This acts as a pressure vessel and keeps all the other parts of the rocket motor together. At either end of that tube, you have pieces that hold everything else inside of that tube. These are called closures. You typically have a forward closure and a nozzle closure. The next concentric tube inside of the case is called the liner. This is typically made from thick paper or a phenolic resin. This liner acts as a thermal barrier between the super hot combustion gases and the temperature sensitive case. Inside of the liner, you have several other tubes. These are called casting tubes, and these allow you to work with the propellant in smaller quantities than in having to work with the entire rocket motor at once. To close out the rocket motor at either end, we have held in place by the closures a forward closure. This acts as the dome at the top of the rocket engine, holding sometimes an igniter, a pressure sensor, or just a smoke grain on a commercial motor. And at the other end, you have the nozzle. We'll be talking about the forward closure of the nozzle in future videos. Alright, now we need to pick a scale to work at. I have several rockets with 54mm motor mounts, so we're going to be making a 54mm motor. Conveniently, by working at a standard diameter that is used by the hobby, we have lots of parts we can purchase instead of having to make from scratch. And also, a lot of the work has already been done for us as far as dimensioning these parts and ensuring that they have good fit and tolerance. We could start with a smaller rocket motor, but I find working at smaller scales, it's sometimes hard to see what's going on, and it also requires a lot of detail work. So keep in mind that while we are working at a larger scale, it may be easier to get a grasp of what's going on, but there will be more energy involved in the propellant, so if something goes wrong, it will be a little more exciting. The other inevitable side effect of working at a larger scale is that everything costs a little bit more, but I think we can get around it for this case. Alright, to get started designing the rest of the rocket motor, we need to know what dimensions we're working with. And since this is a COTS 54mm case, we already know that the case is going to be 2.125 inches on its outer diameter. The inner diameter of that case is going to be 2.0 inches, so the next component, that is the thermal liner, is going to have to slide inside of that. Now conveniently, there's this online store called the Rocket Motor Parts Store, and this sells wound phenolic tubes that you can use as thermal liners. The thermal liners have an outer diameter of 1.98 inches and an inner diameter of 1.875 inches. Inside of this will go the casting tubes, and the casting tubes uh, match that outer, inner diameter of the thermal liner, and then they have an inner diameter of 1.8 inches even. So we know that the outer diameter of our rock propellant is going to have a diameter of 1.8 inches, so everything has to fit inside of that. 
Now, moving on from this, we're going to download a piece of software called Open Motor. And Open Motor is a design tool that will let us simulate how our rocket motor will perform without having to actually make one and burn it. Open Motor is free open source software that I helped develop. We can use Open Motor to replace older tools like BurnSim or Naka.xlsx, both of which are either expensive or a little outdated. Open Motor is undergoing active development right now, and we're adding tons of cool features like simulations for pressure transients, erosive burning. Now, a rocket motor is often divided into sections called grains. We use grains because it's easier to work with a small quantity of propellant at once instead of having to work with the entire rocket motor all at the same time. Using grains also makes it easier for us to use different geometries for each section of propellant. These geometries can be adjusted to change how much thrust and impulse the rocket motor provides. Different geometries are also better at packing more propellant into the rocket motor and wasting less space. For a rocket motor this small, I'd normally just use Bates grains, that is, ballistic test and evaluation grains. These were developed by the military way back when to have an approximately neutral thrust curve. A Bates grain is shaped like a cylinder that has a single perforation down the middle in the shape of a smaller cylinder. The grain burns inside out and from both ends towards the middle. By virtue of this being a tutorial though, I thought I would show you some more interesting geometries as well, so you could potentially incorporate them into your designs. To facilitate this, I've decided to make a three grain motor. The top two grains will be Bates grains, but the bottom grain is going to be something called a finisil, that is, fins on a cylinder. So to set this up in open rocket, there's a few things we need to do. So first, <clears throat> we need to create a new motor. So we'll open up the package, and then we'll come down here and we're going to select our propellant, and we're using Cherry Limeade. It's already helpfully pre-configured into the software package, so we don't have to do anything here. Now we're going to go down to the bottom and make sure it's set up for a Bates, and we're going to click Add Grain. This will let us set up a new cylindrical grain with a 1.0 inch outer diameter. The port diameter, that is the size of the middle hole, is going to be half an inch to start with. We can tweak this later. We're going to make this grain 4 inches long. Neither end will be inhibited, and the core diameter will be half an inch. Now remember, we can change all these settings later to make sure that the design fulfills our objectives. So we'll apply that, and now we've got one grain set up in our motor. So we're going to go ahead and copy that, so we've got two Bates grains, and then we're going to switch the geometry type from Bates into Finisil. Now we'll go ahead and add that grain. This is going to be another 4 inch long grain. It's going to have neither inhibited ends, and it's going to have five fins. Each fin is going to be an eighth of an inch wide, and each fin is going to be four tenths of an inch long. And we'll make the core diameter half an inch again. Now, we need to pick a diameter for the throat of this motor. This is one of the most important parameters in any rocket motor, since the throat controls the pressure, the thrust, and the burning efficiency of the rocket motor. Now, because this is the most important parameter on the rocket motor, I'm gonna take a wild guess and type in 0.5 inches. There's a few other parameters that the motor needs, but we aren't going to worry about them so much for now. So for example, we're just going to set the uh, nozzle exit diameter to be 1.8 inches, the same as the propellant outer diameter, and that's just something that's easy to build. We'll build a perfectly efficient nozzle, and it's going to be a uh, 15 degree divergence angle, 30 degree convergence angle nozzle. That's pretty standard for most solid rocket motors. Um, and the throat length is going to be 20 thou. Um, and that's just something that's easy to manufacture. And you go ahead and you can actually look and you can see a visualization of the cross-section of your rocket motor. So we'll go ahead and apply that. And then now it's time to run the simulation and see what happens. So we're just going to hit Control r and we'll see what pops up. Alright, quick break to discuss what we just learned here. A solid rocket motor generates thrust by converting a solid into a hot gas. And then that hot gas is expanded through a nozzle to create velocity and a mass with a velocity has momentum, and conservation of momentum dictates that the rocket motor then must move in the opposite direction of the gas uh, with a similar force. The velocity of the flow times the mass gives you that thrust of the rocket motor. The amount of mass thrown out of the back of the nozzle is equal to the mass of the propellant vaporized in that instant. This makes finding the mass flow of a simple solid rocket easy. Just find the volume of vaporized propellant and then multiply that by its density. On the Bates grains, this is a super easy geometry problem, but on the Finisil, we have to use a fancy algorithm called the fast marching method to find out how much propellant vaporizes. In fact, we can see a really cool visualization of this if we go back to the grain and we look at the regression. You can see these colored lines that show you how the shape of the Finisil changes with time. So towards burnout, notice how the grain actually only has these little triangles of propellant, whereas originally it has these uh, large sweeping fins on the cylinder of propellant. 
And you can visualize that further by going to the grains tab and seeing how the motor geometry progresses with time. So this is it at burnout, and this is it right when you light it. As propellant vaporizes off the surface, the shape of the surface changes. So we need to bookkeep all of these changes as well as the, how the rocket motor is operating each time step. This means that the thrust can change from second to second as the geometry of the grain evolves with time. Since the pressure also depends on how much propellant is vaporizing, the pressure will also change with time. This is a chicken and the egg problem for how we do the math to calculate it, but it's resolved by making a couple of assumptions and then plugging everything in and doing some algebra. Basically, you assume quasi-equilibrium, where the pressure that is used to calculate the current burning properties is the pressure from the millisecond right before this time step when you calculate the burning rate properties. So we have some other information we can extract from this graph. The first thing to talk about is mass flux. This is the velocity of the gas related to the cross-sectional area that is moving through the area. Since we keep adding gas to our pipe as it moves down the motor, the area must increase or the gas velocity will go up. Some velocity is fine, but if the gas velocity gets too high inside of the rocket motor, the flow would be supersonic inside the rocket motor. This leads to some really weird phenomenon and eventually a rapid unscheduled disassembly of your rocket motor. Don't do this. To keep your mass flow low, increase the port size on the lower grains, or by shortening the upper grains. We could increase the diameter of the ports on these bottom two grains in order to give the gas more area so it remains at a lower velocity. You can check what the peak mass flux is in open motor by looking at this area right here. As long as this number is below 2, you're okay. The next important design rule is port to throat area ratio. That is the area of the port right here to the nozzle throat diameter. Gas will always go supersonic at its smallest cross-sectional area if the pressure differential is high enough. If this point at the smallest cross-section is your port instead of your throat, you'll get supersonic flow and just like before, a rapid unscheduled disassembly. Fix this problem by making your throat smaller or your nozzle port larger. The last thing to talk about is Kn. Kn is shown on this graph here in blue. Kn is the ratio of surface area of the propellant to the throat area of the nozzle. Kn is how we calculate the pressure of the motor and a useful non-dimensional property to describe the operating condition of a propellant or motor. For example, Cherry Limeade likes to be between a Kn of 180 and 250. Too low and it burns poorly, and too high and it goes postal. When we change the throat or port area, we change the Kn, so we might need to make adjustments elsewhere on the motor to bring everything back in line. When you're working on your own motor, I'd encourage you to start with simple Bates geometries and play around with the design of open motor. Get a feel for how the motor performance changes as you adjust the different parameters. It's pretty easy. Just type in a different value and hit Ctrl R again to run the simulation. For example, what happens if you make the motor longer? You can expect that if you don't change your nozzle, this will cause your Kn to go up and therefore your pressure to go up. But what would happen, for example, if you increase the diameter of your port in your grain? That would probably also cause your can to grow up, but it would also cause your burn time to decrease, since there's less propellant in the rocket motor now. Eventually, you'll build up an intuition for what works and what doesn't as you attempt to resolve various design challenges in your rocket motor. You should probably spend a good few hours playing around an open motor before you commit to building any hardware. Alright, so this rocket motor is going to produce about 415 newtons of thrust for about 3.7 seconds. It's typically good practice to design your rocket motors so that they produce less thrust as the burn progresses. This reduces the force on your rocket as it accelerates. But this is something for you to hash out with your aerostructures engineer. I'll be including links to the open motor download, this rocket motor design file, as well as the best solid rocketry resource on the internet, nakarocketry.net, in the description down below. This series is being made possible by my generous supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to help support this series or future series like it, as well as get exclusive access to some content, you can check out my Patreon, also linked down below. If you don't want to throw your money at a random internet person, but you still want to help support this series, I'd really appreciate it if you share this video. Especially this video. I hope that this video will lead to more people making rocket motors the right way, instead of the dangerous and possibly illegal rocket candy motors you typically see YouTube tutorials show you how to make. Hopefully, we can work together to make serious amateur rocketry more approachable for everybody. In the next episode, we'll talk about how to design and manufacture the case of the rocket motor, as well as where to buy one if you lack the skills or machines necessary to make your own. If you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, go ahead and click the bell button down by the subscribe button. If you have any questions about what happened in this video, feel free to leave a comment. I try and respond to all the questions I can. That's it for this episode, so until next time, I'm Charlie Garcia, good luck and Godspeed.